Okay, well, welcome everybody uh, to the May 19th, 2015 meeting of the Northampton Transportation and Parking Commission. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the chair of the commission. I'm also the city councilor for Ward 3. And there seems to be more present, so I'll call the meeting to order. The first thing I'll do is announce the audio and video recording of this meeting. Um, we're also taking minutes. Our, our clerk has stepped out, but she'll be back and we'll fill in for her uh, in the meantime. And I'd also like to begin the benefit of the public by introducing ourselves, um, going around the room and introducing ourselves, starting with our vice chair. I'm Lisa Klein, the city council for uh, Ward 3. I almost said Ward 7. You should be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Ward 7. Very proud of Ward 7. I'm uh, Ned Hupley, Director of Public Works. Dave Pomerantz, Director of Central Services. James Lowenthal, I'm a citizen member and also representative of the uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Um, Nancy Forrestal, Park and Park and Parking Enforcement Administrator. Devin Bruce, uh, who also sits on the Planning Board. Chris Sinkowitz, uh, Chief of Police. Okay, thank you very much. And we begin, as we always do, with public comment. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to speak on any subject they wish. Uh, I'd ask you to keep it to about three minutes, especially because there's a large number of people here today who may want to comment. I also like to provide the kind of disclaimer that it's frequently the case that uh, individuals will come to this commission with specific problems or requests. It's not 100% of the time that they leave with their um, issue completely resolved. Um, just because it may be the first time we're hearing about it and that kind of thing. But you should know that um, I as the chair or other members of the commission will follow up with you afterwards. Um, and it's a time to uh, share your observations and thoughts about any issue you want. Generally, there's not a back and forth. Uh, but members of the commission may ask questions to kind of clarify and get more information. So with that disclaimer being said, um, you can clamor over each other to privilege of being the first. Um, Mr. Clare, if that would honor for you. If you could state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Thomas Clary. My address is 31 Southampton Road, West Hampton. Um, dear Commissioner, there's confusion and contradictory information related to speed limits on Route 66 in Northampton, with multiple laws in conflict with one another. I'd like this commission to address these issues and provide clarity and consistency so that the public may travel safely this road. And I hereby request the following. One, an engineering study of Route 66 in Northampton, beginning at the West Hampton Town Line, to determine appropriate speeds. Two, the removal of the existing speed limit signs posted along Route 66 in Northampton, which are in violation of state law and not legally enforceable. According to Mass Highway Traffic Engineering, most motorists are able to select a reasonable and safe speed Additionally, the Commonwealth recommends that using the 85th percentile as base for setting speed limits. The 85th percentile is the speed at which or below 85% of the vehicles are traveling. Speeds are typically assumed to be normally distributed, which results in a probability of distribution. Knowing this distribution allows for the targeting of egregious violators. Additionally, studies have shown that as vehicle speeds deviate from the mean, the risk of a crash increases. Using the 85th percentile method lessens variations of speeds within a traffic stream. The risk of a crash is increased by traveling at speeds above the mean, but also by traveling at speeds below the mean. Alex Bublik, traffic engineer from North End Public Works, informed me the city has no traffic data for the segment of Route 66 at the West Hampton Town Line. Mass General Law Chapter 9, Section 18 allows for the posting of numerical speed limits. This law also indicates that any such speed limit must be based on an engineering study and needs approval via a special speed regulation approved by the Registry of Motor Vehicles and Mass Highway. All regulatory speed limit signs not posted under this procedure are in violation of the law and not legally enforceable. Chapter 90, Section 17 of National Law dictates statutory speed limits in the absence of official speed postings made under 9018. In other words, if a speed limit has not been established under Chapter 90, Section 18, requiring the posting of speed limits according to a special speed regulation, this roadway limits can be enforced according to 9017. No speed signs posted. The statutory speed limits in this section, specifically, it would be 40 miles per hour based on an undivided highway outside of a thickly settled or business district for a distance of a quarter of a mile. The Northampton Assessor maps confirm this spacing. My wife was cited by a Northampton police officer to travel on Route 66 in December of 2014. Since this time, I've paid particular attention to the sign postings to travel on this road, particularly in the areas of West Farm Roads that are currently posted at 30 and 25 miles per hour. 
I regularly have anywhere from 8 to 18 cars counting me in close proximity on this country road. My ability to count cars is constrained by the horizon, so there may be additional vehicles that I can't see. And I have a video taken this morning showing at least nine cars following me. Additionally, at least once a week, vehicles pass me illegally as I travel to post the speed limit. And last week, I was passed by a pool truck transporting several thousand gallons of water. According to 720 CMR Department of Highways 906, operation of vehicles obstructing traffic, no person shall drive in such a manner as to obstruct unnecessarily the normal movement of traffic upon a highway, and officers complete over for this obstruction. I am clearly obstructing traffic given the line of cars behind me on Route 66 and the regularity with which I am passed by other vehicles. The posted speeds are creating a hazardous community. I believe they are likely to result in serious accidents and harm to those driving in public obstruction. Today, I was informed by the North Hampton Police Department has received a grant under the Click It or Ticket program and is specifically targeting the section of Route 66. One officer informed me today that this area is known to have regular speed of travel in excess of the posted signs. My wife received a citation for $100 in December when she was traveling on Route 66 just east of the West Hampton town line. Upon contacting my insurance company, I learned that this $100 citation would cost an additional $1,800 in increased premiums over the next several years. This was her first citation, so the increase was due entirely to this incident. My wife contested the citation and was found not responsible, saving us nearly $2,000. However, she needed to spend two days in front of a magistrate and a judge to save this money and was not able to be employed during this time. The current speed limits posted along Route 66 are creating a threat to public safety. I request that the City of Northampton conduct a traffic study of Route 66, and I also request that the City remove all existing signs until the traffic study is complete, since they conflict with state traffic law. I have a copy of this letter for the members of the commission, and I would also like to invite each of you individually to the farm, traveling along that road uh, for a coffee or an apple, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions for Mr. Cleary? Um, it's an item that we may want to add to a future agenda for full deliberation, but Mr. Cleary wanted to come and, and make his case, and we appreciate the information provided. Thank you. Can I leave these for you? Yes, if you would. Other public comment? Mr. Jukes, are you Are, are we uh, actually supposed to wait until we're called up, or is this part of the part traffic of it? comment from North Main Street yeah. has its own agenda. Okay, item. great. Um, thanks. Would you mind waiting until after public comment? Not at all. Great, thank you. Mr. Heath. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Heafy. I live in an apartment on Elm Street near the Autumn Inn. And I grew up in that area, so I'm very familiar with the crosswalks and the traffic on Elm Street. I'm also a friend of the senior who just graduated from Smith, Andrea Tonko from Mexico. She was the one who was hit in a traffic accident in front of the Helen Hills Chapel on the 25th of April. I'm very familiar with the case because I hired a lawyer for her. I received and have copies of the police report. Um, in addition, I went to Bay State for her evaluation of her concussion, which is quite serious. Um, and so I'm bringing to your attention the fact that Smith College, a population of 2,000, has a campus on two sides of a state highway. And although there was a police report by Northampton, there was no report done by Smith College. And this student was told by staff members at Smith that they were not liable or responsible and that they did not file a police report, a campus police report. And so I call this to your attention because I feel that these students who are, many of them from other countries, a population of 2,000 students, visitors in our town, um, should have good protection going from one side of the campus across Elm Street to the other side. I've certainly seen how effective the crosswalks are at Wilson Academy in East Hampton. We're certainly familiar with the one down on Conn Street near the Senior Center. We certainly know UMass has those crosswalks that are well lit with flashing lights. And we certainly see that their sister school, Mount Holyoke, also has that. Um, so I feel that Smith is well known for its fellowships for its Fulbrights, but we certainly don't need Smith well known for its injuries and fatalities. And I would hope that the last injury that we see at Smith College for the student is Andrea. But I'm willing to work with anyone to see that better crosswalks are put down on 
probably several locations, um, certainly in front of the Hallett Hills Chapel where that occurred, and uh, also on Paradise Lane, which I found very dark, especially on rainy nights with reflected lights coming toward me. And so I'm willing to work with anyone to secure, figure out what the funding should be, where it should come from, and to make a difference. So thank you very much, Ryan. I'm also here with Chris Davis, the tennis coach, who is Chris's was um, coach for Andrea, and um, I think we're both very familiar with this case, and we, as citizens of this town, are more than willing to do what we can to make a difference. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you. Well, we appreciate that, and also appreciate your time, both of you coming today. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the commission on this subject? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, could you just tell me that again? Heafy? Henry Heafy. H-E-A-P-H-Y. H-E-A. And you're on the bicycle? I am, and I'm and also I, a professor. And I, and I bicycle quite a bit on Elm Street, so. <laughs> uh, we'll get in touch. I'm also a professor at Smith, and I'm uh, involved and know a number of people. Smith. Have you contacted anybody besides uh, besides Chris? I have contacted people, yes. Um, and uh, I will say that my contacts thus far have not been satisfactory. So Can I just give you my card and we'll follow up? That's terrific. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Deacon? Yes, I'm sorry. I good. wanted to add a, another story to that. Um, my neighborhood off of South Street got very involved when your Smith theater student got hit in the crosswalk about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was she was badly injured. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the neighborhood went about doing things. I, I guess I'm not really wanting it to be restricted to the road that runs between Smith. This was a Smith student. I mean, she didn't, mm -hmm. that, that story didn't feel any better or any different. Right, um, right. So, I, so I'm not sure it's just those crosswalks. In some ways, I think I'm a little more sensitized to that route mm -hmm. and, and students crossing. I think we all in town have learned that that is to be expected. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's a, a broader topic. Than that. I agree, and that's one part of it, but I'm certainly, with 2,000 students crossing that route um, very frequently every day. Um, it's certainly an area that deserves, I think, a good deal of credit. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Donnelly, you have the air conditioning on in here, so you either need to close the windows or take for energy conservation purposes. You can open the windows and turn off the air conditioning. We already have a pre commission anger with us. We can print out all our agendas. We don't need the energy and sustainability commission. Um, is there other public comments? I'm Peter Clary, and I live at 130 Main Road in North and I also want to talk about the um, yeah. issues on Route 66. Um, I'm more concerned about the safety issues rather than the legality of the closest to um, Just so you know, this is not the first time I have come to the city for questions on here and that. Um, several years ago, Councilor Marion Barge had a public forum um, on this specific issue. Um, there were several people, I said myself, with similar comments on this. Um, at the time, I asked her and the mayor to make a progress in it. Um, followed up with Council Large a few months after that, and she told me that if I wanted a traffic study done, I should ask, ask the town of West Hampton to fund that traffic study. I feel that is a rather quick response in, in response to the safety issue. My concern is if you travel at the closest speed of 25 miles per hour on a, city, on a, on a state highway, where the speed limit feels like it should be much, much faster, you put yourself at great risk. When I travel the speed limit, there are cars tailgating me, there are cars passing me, there are cars double passing me, passing both me and the car behind me. At one point, a car passed me at an intersection where the road comes into West Hampton, that intersection there. The car that had tailgating me from the point when the speed limit switched to 25 passed me at that intersection which I consider an incredible safety hazard, which is caused by the policy of the city of Northampton. When you hit the West Hampton line, the speed limit with a little bit of change in the road, but not much, switches to 45 miles per hour, which indicates to me it's a political decision, not a safety decision, to have the speed limit at 25 miles per hour. I'd like to know, I, I know the police chief is here, I hope I don't get myself into trouble. <laughs> when, I, when I travel on this road with my two-year-old daughter, I do not travel with Fiona, and I'm not going to travel with Fiona because I don't want to put her at risk. And that's it's. I feel like 
traveling the speed limit, we'll put her at risk, which isn't something I want to do. I, I don't want to have to come back to this commission saying that there was an injury on the road because of the city's policies. I'd like this addressed beforehand. And I hope you can do what you can. Um, I know there is opposition to this on the city council. Um, I'm not sure why, um, because this is a safety risk. And I invite any of you to come travel with me. We can drive, you know, we spend a half hour driving back and forth in that road after speeding on that. And you'll feel like you're in danger. And I, I, if you do travel this road, maybe you think you drive the speed limit. I haven't gotten a speed, speeding ticket since I was 18. That was almost 20 years ago. When I drive this road, the only way I can drive the speed limit is I put my car in cruise control. If my car is not in cruise control, it's impossible. I, I, I drive 25 miles per hour and I feel like I'm going 10 because of the, the nature of this road, 25 miles per hour feels very, very slow. So I hope that this commission and city council will take this up. I hope Northampton feels it's a safety matter and reconsiders the speed limit and does the necessary studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other telecom? Uh, I have a comment for a later agenda item. Should I wait until then? Or? If you wouldn't mind waiting, that would be the best. Any other general public comment for the time being? No? Okay. Seeing none, we'll, we'll launch into our agenda. Um, and I, I guess I would ask, are there any items that we want to bring up sooner? Um, Councilor Klein? I think um, both the North Main Street uh, traffic coming and also the uh, roundabout at Look Park. So we have two people here from Ward 7 who would like to offer comment on those. Okay. Should we take the North Main Street? Okay. Well, the commission be okay moving to item number nine, um, the traffic coming application from North Main Street. I think, I guess it would be best to start with Public so, please. so, my name is uh, Tony Jardina. I live at 112 North Main Street, and I have a little uh, sheet of uh, my witch facts to hand out. Um, and I'm hoping our, uh, our complaint, our issue, is a little bit simpler than the other one. Um, as I indicate on this piece of paper, the distance between Look Park and the center of Florence is 0 0.7 miles. There is, at 0 0.1 mile, a 35 mile per hour traffic, uh, uh, mile per hour sign, which is currently obscured by two big trees. You don't really see that until you come upon it. At one, 0 0.1 miles from the center of, of Florence, there's a 25 mile per hour speed limit, and it's the same going back. It's 35 at uh, the 0 0.1 mile, and then there's a 15 mile per hour uh, sign just before the park. What's happening is people are starting out, let's say, coming from Luck Park to Florence Center. Whether they're observing that 35 miles an hour or not, everybody is trying to speed up like crazy in the middle distance. There's five of us here who basically live in that middle distance. When you get to Bardwell and you, when you get to Lily, you have incredible speeds. Our house is shaking every morning for a half an hour to an hour every time a truck goes by. And that's the uh, experience we're all having. I've lived there for 27 years, and I know there's police presence at either end. I have never seen, and I'm a writer, I work at home, I have never seen a a uh, police car parked on Bardwell or on Lily. I have never seen one of those electronic signs, whatever they're called, indicating how people are, uh, the, the speed that people are at. And I, we all feel strongly it's time we get some relief from this, because though the number of cars going by is not something we can control, the speed is something. And it's, it's, I've watched it over 27 years just get worse. That's our simple argument. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions or, or comments on the traffic calming application? Or, Councilor, you the kind of brought it um, onto the onto the agenda. Um, could you describe exactly maybe what the traffic calming application seeks to do? Well, I think first we're asking for a study to look at speeds. Um, I actually travel 
that stretch of road from my home to work almost every day, and I, I see firsthand how quickly people are traveling there. I mean, it's far above, far exceeds 35 miles an hour for sure. Um, so I think that we need to put a traffic coming study into effect there to first take a look at it and then see what we can do to actually effectuate some traffic coming measures. And right. I'm wondering if there are any other of the folks here from my community that would like to oh. speak. To would it? any of you like to get up and speak passionately <laughs> or briefly? Well, I, I don't know if I can speak passionately, <laughs> but I, I, I've been. I've lived, on the street since, I've lived on the street since uh, 1978, and uh, certainly as the traffic has increased a lot, um, I'm, I'm guessing because there's more uh, building and more people li living up in, up in the hill towns. But, um, but I, I, I just to relate some things that I've seen, usually once or twice a year I see somebody passing somebody else in front of my house. And as it's been said, um, in, in, in folks from West Hampton, uh, people aren't going 25 miles an hour and somebody's passing them. Um, uh, and it's, that, that's a, there's a double, double line there, right? There's no, there's, there's no passing in that area. It is, it is true, um, uh, people are speeding up both ways. Um, and uh, houses, houses do rattle when the, when the trucks go by. Um, there are no, there are two new crosswalks on the street, which are really good, except for it's been observed that nobody observes them, which is really, which is really problematic because as I've seen that uh, the neighborhood change, there's more kids in the neighborhood now, and uh, um, uh, a week or so ago I, I was out in my yard and I heard the bus, the bus dropping kids off, and the reason I knew that they were out there was because I heard, I heard his horn going, and. Um, they were disregarding the bus stop at a crosswalk. So aside from the speed, there's also an, an increased number of kids in the neighborhood, which which makes it makes for some um, additional concern. Next question. Um, have you seen a difference since the road was repaved, or does it seem like cars are going faster um, since last summer? I wish that that were true. I, this has been something that's been pretty consistent for a while. But one of the things I like to do, because I'm, I'm an obnoxious driver, is I like to go the speed limit. And when you do that, and this, I've been doing this for a while, you just the road rage you see just yesterday when I drove, as the gentleman who spoke before, when I drove the speed limit on my little mileage testing drive, and I just was pulling into my house, the guy in back of me was going insane. Just pulling up, you know, into the next lane and passing me, and uh, and that is very, very common on that stretch. So no, I don't think it's just the, the pavement. Uh, could I just add? The, the, I'm Tony Jardina's wife, Eileen Jardina. The uh, the other thing that's difficult is because so many of those houses, their driveways are right on that street. So when you're trying to pull out, you know, you see a break in the traffic, you try to pull out. You, have, you will always have someone on your tail kind of honking, not allowing you even the time and the space to pull out into traffic. But and you know, the, the thing that sort of motivates this is we all know when you drive through Williamsburg, we all know because we've all been pulled over if we're going 35 <laughs> miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. We know to slow down. Just as we know on, you know, across from the, uh, the, the Smith Farm, down there before you get to the recycling center where there is frequently a, uh, a, a police car. And we know it's there to slow down the traffic to get to Florence. But the fact is, the continuing presence, it's not there all the time. But the fact that we know there might be a car there, we all slow down. Mm. And sir, could we get your name for the record? Oh, uh, Dan Dissinger. Thank you very much. 166. Oops. I'm Robert Friedman. I live on Greeley Avenue, which is right on the corner of uh, North uh, Main Street. And I get a bird's eye view. I do a lot of walking into the center of Northampton. Right outside my home is that brand new crosswalk. And uh, I get to stand there for a long time watching the traffic going by. One, wondering, is anyone going to stop? Virtually nobody does but I get a good blast of 
wind as the cars move by at a pretty good rate of speed, and I see that every day. So, okay. Are there any other public comments on this item? More passionate. We're a passionate group on <laughs> Mark Main Street. Um, we have a, a non-resident who would like to speak on this issue. A non-resident of yeah. Ward 7. So I, I just want to say, as I've been listening to this, I've uh, uh, for many years been advocating for uh, speed limit changes around the high school. And I think it's a related problem along the whole Elm Street corridor, is that the speed limits go up and down. Um, I, I, we have crosswalks at many points. Um, the, the, the speed limit at the high school is 35 miles an hour. I, you know, try driving by there at 35 miles an hour at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when those students are getting out. I dare you to try it. It's, it's in fact, don't do it. It's, it's really scary. Um, but it's inconsistent all up and down the corridor. And there's also been studies done around, and, and I remember this from the high school, that um, when you go over a certain speed, pedestrians stand a greater chance of uh, injury and death, and it, I think it's around 30 miles an hour, right? <laughs> and that why, you know, I, I, I would suggest that while we're having all of these crosswalks all throughout the city, that we also have some sort of speed limit that matches what's safe for having those crosswalks. And um, you know, anything over 30 miles an hour, we're inviting tragedy. So that's my two cents. Smash. No words. So I, I guess it's been a few months since we have dealt with the traffic calming application. So let's let's review the process, also for the benefit of the public and frankly me. Um, the first step in any traffic calming application is after we've received it. Mr. You, you look sure. like you wanted to jump. We usually, first thing we usually do at the request of the Transportation Parking Commission is put on traffic counters. And we get an idea of the volume, the speed, the classification of vehicles usually we get. That's after a vote by this commission. That's correct. Right. That's the first thing that we do is take a look to see if there is an issue out there, speeding issue or you know, truck issues, things of that nature. And when we say that, it's it's not to say that we don't believe the experiences of people who actually live there, but there have been other streets that, you know, there have been complaints on, and when we measure it, the results are, in fact, surprising. So that's why we have that procedure in place. So that's what we would be doing today, is simply voting to authorize a traffic study as the first step. We will get the results back, and at that point, we would consider them and vote again on whether to proceed with traffic accurate description of the process. I just want to check in about something else. Um, one of the things when I was contacted by Mr. Giardino, we were in touch with the chief and um, just asked about increased police presence. Is it possible to put a uh, patrol car there on a more regular basis? Um, and I wonder if you could just kind of report to us if that was done, what the results were. Well, at the same time, there's three other neighborhoods with the same issue now that folks, so I don't have the statistics, but I think I responded to North Main and Nantuck with the number of patrols that we have, the static stationary radar patrols and number of tickets that we've written, yeah. that uh, we have a list of all different inputs that want yeah. the electronic speed monitoring sign, which is old and we're repairing, and you're definitely going to get on the list. The uh, point that was made about the cruises running radar at either end was heated in the area car will pay more attention to the middle range area. Yeah, I appreciate that, because really, it's the middle distance. And I, I, on the sheet I gave you, the distance, uh, Bardwell and Lily are in the exact middle of that 0 0.7, uh, uh, 0.07 stretch. That's where the speed is the greatest. And we do, I mean, we do our enforcement based on data, accident numbers, et cetera. That's our concentration. But we also leave enough room for community citizens requests and support. Uh, and we try to address those as we can. Uh, but, I mean, the Florence car has a tremendous geographic area to cover. Um, and, I, and I always do this because I ask, is, how many patrol cars do you think are on patrol on a given time covering the entire city? In our You're asking me? Yeah. Well, would you well, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a bad answer if you ask me that. Well, let's put a little bit of Perception is reality in a lot of ways, though. So. How many cars do you think we have on out there monitoring, I don't know, 35, 5, 6? 
So we have four cruisers. Four? Group covering the 60 some odd square miles in the Amazon, answering over 150 calls a day. So when we can fit in traffic enforcement, we do. We invested in every car to have forward and rear facing radar uh, so they can run radar in any direction, moving or otherwise. Uh, Handheld units, plain close details. We invest a fair amount of time in the investigations or the, the enforcement issues, but we're a busy department. So there's one of those, and I'm sorry, I don't have the name of it, one of those electronic signs to tell you, um, and it's being repaired right now? Right. It's, we're trying to find funding for it. They're about $15,000. Yeah. And the one at Smith is immovable. And it's that's there all the time. All and I, all with all due respect. No, no, it's all by Smith. It actually right. reflects the rock speed limit. It's not 25. It's there. an advisory. <laughs> it's an advisory sign. So, uh, <laughs> which is another point. But, you know, we will continue to do the best we can. We get any number of grants. A click it or ticket allows us to put out probably 16 four hour patrols, um, basically enforcing any mo moving motor vehicle because that's the only way we can actually stop a car to find out something that's not wearing a seatbelt. We just started a distracted driving one, which is really important because there's so many of them. Um, and that's another 16 blocks of four hours of patrol uh, dedicated to the enforcement. And we move them into different geographic areas. I mean, the distracted driving, the texting stuff, one officer, four hour period of time, wrote 18 people. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> distracted driving is the worst thing you can do mm. because it leads to speeding, it leads to inattention. And inattention, this is the leading cost for motor vehicle access and speed. So we're trying to do the best we can. Um, and I'll just segue into another grant we just received that uh, will address Mr. Eve and the council, as I talked, I think, two months ago about applying for a state grant for not only crosswalk and uh, pedestrian and bicycle enforcement, but uh, we picked the six highest priority streets, Elm Street, Main Street, Pleasant Street, King Street, South Street, so five, six, whatever, I lost count, a couple others, <laughs> for crosswalk enforcement. And the whole purpose is to not only enforce people that don't stop for pedestrians, but pedestrians that jaywalk, and also the bicyclists that don't obey the rules of the road. And it's not just education enforcement. The component is when you stop the person, the question is, why? Why did you act the way you acted? Because this committee and I, frankly, wanted to find out more data when we were dealing with the crosswalk issues about you can educate people by enforcement, by threat, but unless you know what's behind the motivation for their not stopping or not, you know, looking, looking both ways before they step in a crosswalk or whatever, we're trying to develop that database for information to guide further, further uh, engineering programs. But there's nothing like seeing a, a cop car parked on the street to, oh, I to remind you that you got to behave yourself. I agree. You know, I, there's nothing like that. I wish I had more people to put out there. Mm -hmm. uh, that they weren't so busy, so they could. Uh, but we, we try the best we can. And this $16,000 grant will give us, at the six crosswalks that we picked, four monthly mobilizations for six months. And we'll gather the data and we partner with the Pioneer Valley Planning that's going to crunch the data and hopefully come back after I retire, by the way, with some information that will lead to further discussions and you know designs that might be needed. You know, it's true, the lighted crosswalks are great. But pedestrians don't use the lights to light the crosswalk. They're impatient, they don't want to wait that extra time. Um, and crosswalk, most of our accidents at crosswalks, the cars being rear-ended because people's inattention. They don't stop for the car that stopped for the pedestrian. So there's, it, it's a complex problem. We're trying to address it the best way we can. Um, and, and I'd like to, to thank you and congratulate you for receiving the grant and doing the work to get it. And I think that would be Data to yeah, and that's really the, the bulk of our traffic enforcement because we can dedicate people to it unless there's a very serious call that we're just going to pull them off on. Which happens more and more, unfortunately. But that's some of the things we're doing, you know, proactively to get the enforcement out there. And the communication I had with whoever from North Main Street, I think I see C. John, most of it. What's that? That was me. That was you. All right, we'll put more cars out there. We'll get you on the list um, again because other neighborhoods are asking for that right our board we keep looking for grant money for another electronic speed monitoring sign um, well if it ever helps in grant applications to have 
us write something, of course we're happy to do that. We need to have the, the voices of people who are actually affected. So I'm cognizant of effectively the long agenda, um, but we can take more comments on this. But we do Just very briefly, have, have you already discussed maybe offline outside of this meeting the, the process that follows uh, for um, com uh, prioritizing, uh, uh, ranking this proposed project? You would summarize it yeah, to supplement the description we just went through. No, okay. Um, even if we all agree it's a good idea, we don't, first of all, hold any purse strings uh, on this commission. Um, what we do have is a, uh, a system that's been in place for several years for ranking this proposal, assuming it moves forward, this traffic common request, along with the other roughly two dozen uh, that are on the books in the city. Um, and uh, the ranking includes things like um, uh, the speed compared to the speed limit, the existence, the presence or lack of sidewalks on, on one or both sides, the, the presence or absence of um, uh, various uh, pedestrian destinations, of which are obviously many in this case, uh, crash records, accident records, uh, going back several years. So all these data get collected, uh, including measuring the, the number and speed and the type of vehicles, uh, crash records from the police department, all that gets thrown into the hopper, and a numerical number comes out, bing, that then is compared uh, with all the other uh, two dozen uh, requests in the city to rank it, uh, where the top ranked ones get the most attention, and when money does become available, which it actually is at this time for the first time in, in many years, um, then the top ranked a few get considered first. I'd like to move that we uh, vote on uh, conducting a traffic study on our community Okay. Great. Councilor Klein makes the motion uh, to move forward. Is there a second? Okay. Mr. Pomerantz makes the second. Is there any discussion on approving? Traffic study meaning collecting data. Correct. Okay. And is moving forward with the first step in the traffic coming process, analysis process. Okay. Yeah. Any other discussion? I've got a question. Are we, do we have a traffic common project on Bridge Road, which is the other triangle box from the circle? Is that, do we have one open there right now? I believe we do. That would be number 22. Okay. Well, I mean, what's happening is that you're, you're getting some portion of the traffic coming down and they're getting the other, so I just uh, wanted you to know that. I wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Thank you very much. And Thank you all very much. As we go forward. Thank you. <laughs> Council, what's the other item you want to do? The question about bicycle signs for bicyclists in the Park roundup. Do you want to call on whoever? Yeah, let me just give a little bit of background here. I was contacted by a number of folks in Leeds who uh, travel around the roundabout uh, park on a daily basis. Um, I myself do that as well. And they're concerned that they've seen a number of accidents, or near accidents, I should say, with bicyclists who are um, not heating the traffic, they're just kind of cutting across the crosswalks uh, without getting off of their bicycles. The request that was made by this small group of citizens was that um, we post signs that say that bicyclists must get off their bikes and walk across the, the uh, crosswalks. Um, we have here somebody from Ward 7 who is an avid bicyclist who wants to speak to this. Um, I also have some comments that I'd like to make about it, but I'd love to have Caleb get up and uh, share his thoughts about this. So we're at 17A is the item we're on. You're following at home. 17B. 17B, thank you. So please, thank Hi. you. My name is Caleb Langer. I live at 32 Powell Street in Florence. Uh, as Councillor Klein points out, um, I use our bicycle transportation network on a daily basis, um, including getting up and uh, going around the, the foot park uh, or at times. Um, I, I saw this item on the agenda and it was of concern to me. Um, I can certainly understand why why it was brought forward um, with some bicyclists who uh, come to the crosswalk and enter at a high rate of speed without regard to any other users. Um, that practice is absolutely unacceptable, um, and it, it pains me when I, I see people doing that. Um, 
the way I use the, the crosswalks as I think most other reasonable people do. Um, if I'm riding, I, I approach, I slow down, stop. Um, I verify if there's traffic uh, coming in either direction. Um, and once it's clear or if the traffic decides to yield, which they're not obligated to do, but many people in Northampton do that, uh, they yield in both directions. And I will go ahead and, and cross at a, a controlled speed. Um, I'd like to point out, because I, I think that there's um, some confusion, um, the issue of bicycles in, in crosswalks is uh, certainly a gray area. A lot of people would like to have you believe that bicycles are not allowed to ride in a crosswalk. Um, and there isn't anything in Massachusetts state law that explicitly prohibits bicycles uh, from riding in crosswalks outside of central business districts. Um, so in terms of the uh, proposed signage for requiring bicycles to walk, uh, it's, it's not enforcing a state law. Um, it essentially, in my mind, what it serves to do is it serves to uh, penalize cyclists and uh, add, add a hindrance to them for, for using the trail network um, because it's certainly an inconvenience um, to, to stop at, at every street crossing and get up and walk. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, uh, I don't think that I've ever seen that at normal trail crossings. Um, and really what it does is it, is it also creates, if somebody is doing that, it creates an imposition for motorists because they're being slowed down by somebody stopping and walking across the road as opposed to riding a bike. Um, adding signage, in my mind, there's, there are stop signs at every one of these crossings. We all know what stop sign means, and, and that's why people behave in the manner that I do of coming up and stopping at the stop sign. When people act in that way, there, there's no problem, um, and therefore no reason to require them to walk across the street. As far as people who ignore those signs and go ahead and ride right out to traffic, I have no reason to believe that they would be inclined to see a sign that says walk your bicycle across and would obey that sign uh, when they've continued to completely disregard the stop sign uh, for all that time. So um, I, I certainly understand the issue um, and I, I would hope that um, people could be more understanding of that, um, but I would just want to voice uh, my opposition to adding a, a signage that says to, to walk by okay. across the car. Well, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time to make that comment. Thank you. So on on this item, um, is there further discussion? Council, you said you had something. Yeah, I would like to reinforce exactly what Mr. Miner is saying that, um, and thank you for the, some of the background information. Uh, chapter 89, Section 11 of Mass General Law says that it is um, illegal for a motorist to hit a pedestrian in a crosswalk, but the law doesn't apply to cyclists in a crosswalk because a cyclist is in fact considered um, to be operating a vehicle, not a motor vehicle, but a vehicle, um, which I, I know I'm telling some of you that you already know this, but I think that that's an important piece and I think that is a misunderstanding of the folks um, that contacted me saying that you know, Mass General Law says that you must, bicyclists must walk across crosswalks. That's not the case. Um, but I guess the bigger concern is how can we encourage increased safety? Because it is true, I have seen near accidents many a time in that roundabout. How, what can we do as a commission? Is there something we can do that can increase the safety uh, for bicyclists and motor vehicles in that roundabout, and pedestrians for that matter? And um, there is a crosswalk that um, from the bike path to the other side, I think, of Bridge Road, but there isn't actually a, a stop sign per se. So bicyclists um, are crossing kind of at their own risk. I mean, they're using their common sense, of course, but there is an issue there. If I could just revisit a little bit about uh, the design of the roundabout as it pertains to these issues. Um, all of this um, has been considered a lot by all the designers of roundabouts for many decades, and specifically for this one, in advance of any construction. 
Um, so these are not new issues for any of us. Um, the design of the roundabout is explicitly uh, intended to slow the traffic down to, I can't remember what the design speed limit is, but it's roughly 15 miles an hour. 15 to 20. Right. So um, God forbid that there's a crash like the ones we've been talking about near misses, but if there is one, it's very unlikely to be a fatal one because the cars are already going so slow. So it's an inconvenience. I, I, I'm not to say this is not an issue that should not be addressed. I'm just saying, in terms of safety, um, the, the fact that there is a well-designed roundabout there already uh, greatly minimizes the chance of a significant risk. And this has been shown statistically over and over again, even before our roundabout. 90% reductions in fatalities and serious uh, injury accidents are typical numbers, and I'm sure that that's the case here. Um, and I just and I want to uh, uh, echo what uh, Councilor Klein and uh, Mr. Langer said, that uh, it is a bit of a gray area, but um, uh, remember, we used to have uh, signs on the rail trail saying you must get off and walk, and we don't have it anymore because um, it wasn't enforceable under mass law. It wouldn't be enforceable here. So I think um, uh, my feeling is um, while there may be some risk, it's already much, much less uh, than it was uh, before the roundabout. And uh, I feel as if the design of the roadway is a good one. And as if, as, as if there's something that remains to be done, it's probably in the education field uh, or the education aspect of uh, bicyclists and driver and pedestrian behavior. And uh, mass bike can help and should help and um, will you know, we're committed to educating bicyclists about the right way to, to interact with drivers and pedestrians on the road. We'll continue to do that. Um, but I don't think that signage is uh, as proposed as the way to go. So I also okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? This is just a discussion item. I don't think we have any <coughs> pending action before us. Right? <coughs> other discussion? Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll scratch that one off and, and move on. Um, and I'd like to go back to item number four. We have another visitor who's been waiting patiently. Um, Mary Collier is here. And she is here to make a presentation similar to what she presented to the city council some time ago regarding bicycle safety um, and brain injury awareness. And um, she's going to speak for, we're going to dedicate maybe eight to ten minutes on that. Would you like to sit down while you speak? Um, it might be a lot easier because yeah, I, no, have, feel free. Yeah, I don't have to give because I'm afraid I'm going to put my shaky. Sorry, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. First of all, thank you for committee for hearing me this afternoon. I do. My name is Mary Noel Collier, and I live at Tobin Manor. The, dis the topic I want to bring is brain injuries. It was in 1979, and back then, do you think they knew anything about bicycle helmets for biking? Nope, they did not. And that is how I got mine. I was seven years old, riding on the Charles River with my dad, my dog, and my brother. And the, um, the brakes on my bicycle broke. So I had to put my feet down, I skidded down, and like the cement you see out there in the parking lot, that's what I hit my head on. I had to have surgery on my head. Um, I was an almost seven year old girl. I was doing gymnastics, ballet, reading, doing jigsaw puzzles. But from that day on, my life changed. Um, I was treated at, Boston, at Children's City, Children's Hospital in Boston. And I had, to, had a really large blood clot removed from my brain. So when I woke up from my surgery, big joke now is Mary, you were balder than, balder than Jean-Luc Picard. And I said, the fact is that I didn't have any hair. I look at those pictures and I'm like, who's that girl? Who is that girl in that photo? And I remember it's me. Um, I had seizures back then. And if you know anyone who's had a seizure, they are not fun, they are very painful. Because when you have that seizure, you don't know what's going on at the time. You're flailing around and you have to wait for it to go, stop, and then it stops. And then you just 
get back going. Um, I had to rely on my mom and dad and family members to help me after my surgery because I couldn't do anything. They had to get me to the bathroom, do everything that we, we take for granted for now. Um, I was on a lot of meds. Um, some of you may have or may have not have heard some of these meds. I was on Tegretol, Depakol, Haldol, Prozac. I was on a lot of them. But then it was realized I'm, I'm the kind of person who can't take those meds because they don't work for my system. And um, it was really hard because those meds changed me. I was able to go back to school, but I was in special ed. And was I treated differently? Yeah, I was. Um, I graduated June 24, 15 years to the day of my accident. And that was really, that was hard. That was a surprise. Um, I've been able to have some jobs. I worked at the aquarium. I worked at the Stone Zoo. I now work at the Northampton Senior Center, and I love it. I was, I'm gonna, I just found out I'm gonna be in the Con Street Chronicle next month. They're gonna do an interview with me. They did an interview, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, with concerns to bicycles, I'll tell you something. If you go out and you spend like two or three hours sitting at the Academy of Music, you will see people whizzing in and out of, of the traffic. I've seen one guy come that close to getting hit. And I've seen more people in our town not wearing helmets. I wear one because it's safe. Do I care if it makes me a little dorky or dumb or it's uncomfortable or makes you give you a bad hair day? No, I don't. I would rather have one life, first, one person's life saved than for the hem to have to go through what I go through every single day. Once I was injured, my rehabbing never stopped, and it still doesn't. I do, I get help from the ServiceNet agency, and I'm lucky because they help me when things are tough. I, I, what I believe, committee, is that the discussion on brain injuries at a certain point stops. You hear it and then you say, okay, we'll talk about it. And then guess what? You close the door and it, it is no longer discussed. I've been shut down by the high schools, by the Kennedy School, because they don't want to talk about it because they don't think it's an important issue. The Northampton, they won't even talk to me now. And it really feels like people don't want to talk about this. You cannot read and understand a brain injury by reading something or watching a video. I did a video in, I think, early 2014 for the police department. That was two years ago. Things have changed. Statistics have changed. It's now every it's, it's not every, every 13 seconds in the state of Massachusetts now, somebody gets a brain injury. The estimated costs, instead of being 60 billion, are now 80 billion for our nationwide to pay for, my, for the services I get from anything. The statewide head injury program, which is SHIP, has if you put three of Gillette stadiums back to back, that's how many people in our state are waiting for funding. That's a pretty scary thought. My brain injury changed the way my family sees me, the way I am. But the reason I do my advocacy is not to stop the discussion, it's to continue it. It's to get anyone, any city council member, anybody, to talk with me, to open up the, to open up the doors to talking about this. Because 
it's not going to get any better if we don't talk about it, if we don't discuss it and help people understand how serious it is. If you don't wear a bicycle helmet. A bicycle helmet's cheap. What, like $20 or something? Walmart or someone, if you want one nice, then you yeah, might have to save, spend a little more. But I don't see a big reason why people don't want to wear helmets. To me, it's, it's a safety risk. It's a safety issue. Doesn't mean you're a dork or anything. It just means you want to be safe. I've seen parents with kids not wearing helmets in our town. So if you think I'm like, I don't get upset, you're wrong. Please, committee, help me work with other people and other schools and other agencies to continue the talk in Northampton. Because I love this town and, I, and I'm happy to live here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for, Mary, for taking the time and, and thank you for your advocacy generally on this issue. And I certainly agree this is something that um, obviously can't ignore and we need, we need to pay attention to. And it's kind of the background for a lot of, of what we do. I mean, we don't come here, no one comes here for fun. No. We come here to you know, improve pedestrian safety and uh, safety I, generally. I'd like to ask the per from the bicycle, I'm not sure, I don't remember names because of my injury. What, I'm James Logan. James, I would hope to keep in touch with you. Sure, like absolutely. To. Um, what do you, how do you feel about like the, 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 um, the um, bus stop here? People are whizzing in and out. It just feels like they're not willing to listen. I see parents with kids. I know there's a law, but beyond the education of that certain age, don't people, or do you feel that it's not important for people to wear a helmet? <laughs> yeah. I have mine, I have mine. As you see, I wish I could bike. Ah, my summer's not looking too good at this point, but I do wear a helmet. It's important. So, well, um, so I, uh, I founded and, and, um, and helped lead the um, Pioneer Valley chapter of the statewide bicycle advocacy organization, mm -hmm. MassBike, Massachusetts Bicycle yep. Organization, MassBike.org. Mm -hmm. um, we are very clearly uh, um, and publicly in support of helmet use. Um, we support the, uh, the state law that requires uh, children 12 and under to wear helmets. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, pay close attention to statistics and studies from around the world um, that um, that. Uh, show the, the complexities of the, the issues, including that um, you can still break your neck if you're wearing a helmet, and that it's that you should wear your helmet, but it's even more important not to fall down and to mm -hmm. learn how to do that. So we educate, our, our mission is to uh, promote safe and, and, and uh, friendly uh, bicycling, conditions for bicycling around the state. Mm -hmm. That includes educating bicyclists, um, you know, how to ride safely in traffic, mm -hmm. how not to zip around when it's not appropriate to do so, um, how to avoid getting crashes, what the laws are, why you should obey the laws mm -hmm. for your own good and everybody else's, and then you should wear your helmet. So, mm -hmm. all of that. I'd like to ask one other thing, folks. I'm trying to get more letters of support for um, programs that I'm starting. If anybody would be willing to give me a letter of support, it would help me a lot. So, how well, would that can, happen? We can definitely follow up on that kind of specific. You and I will follow yeah. up on that, Mary. Devin, did you have something? Yeah, I had a, a question about something else. I, um, when I first joined the committee, we had a uh, pace car program. Mm -hmm. And I was reminded of, of that when we were listening to the Route 66 and some of these, you know, I, I don't view it as risky to slow down the traffic behind me. And so I just wondered, if, if who's administering that? And is it still possible to pick up those uh, tags that fit in your back window? Yeah, and does anyone know what? It was always in the mayor's office. Uh, it was in Nigeria. Yeah, it was sort of like a, uh, I promise I'll go to the speed limit, and if I go to the speed limit, the cars behind me have to go to the speed limit. I mean, it was a very practical. It's part of the grading program, too, in the traffic calling application still. Uh, yeah, last time I knew it was being run out of the mayor's office. Okay. Thanks. I just lost my way. So, any, anything else? Anything further on? Uh, Mary's presentation. 
just like to ask a question if I could. Motorcy uh, motorcyclists do have to wear a helmet. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why bicyclists are not required to wear a helmet unless they're 12 or under? It seems to me it's equally important to have that. Um, you're more vulnerable on a bike, perhaps, even than a motorcycle. Long conversation. Very, very long time, time. But right now, the, right now the law is 12 and under, and that's it. It's likely to remain that way for the foreseeable future. Interesting. Hmm. Can I, well, I yes, apologize. Thank you again, Mary. For Thank you. I look forward to following up with you. Oh, definitely. Thank you, Caroline. Okay. Um, all right. So we have two sets of minutes to actually have approved no minutes this year for just various reasons. Um, but we have January 20th and February 17th, 2015. The versions you have have suggested amendments from me uh, incorporating them already. Um, so I entertain a motion on the Senate not to to take them both together as a court for approval. So we can call it. Okay, the Chief makes the motion to approve them both. Councilor Klein seconds. Any discussion or changes to either of the minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Um, item number six is something I don't actually think we need to really get into in the, in the commission. Um, it just pertain to how we um, take these minutes, um, but I've had a discussion with um, our clerk in the Department of Public Works, so I'm assuming the reason to bring it up in this commission now. I say we just move along and not bring it up. So, okay. okay. So, <laughs> By acclaim, we move on um, to number seven, and that is subcommittee updates. And the only subcommittee we have is the Bicycle and Pedestrian Subcommittee, and I was hoping in particular we could hear about an update on the report uh, uh, on the consideration of crosswalks and evaluation criteria um, from a couple months ago that we were talking about. So, Devin, I don't know if you want to change. Uh, yeah, James made the last bicycle. No. The, the, the last one was canceled, the one before that I missed. The ah. last one, the last two were canceled. <coughs> the last two bike and Oh, I'm sorry. No. Yeah. The last bike, there, there, was was no, no, there was no bicycle and right. pedestrian committee meeting last week. Okay. And there was one last month, but I missed it. So. Um, I, I have a set of characteristics that I think are relevant to try to identify for crosswalks. I was a little daunted to realize we had over 600 of them in the community. So I think we're sort of refiguring what that might look like. Um, the most constructive move I've seen that, that we have is, is the grant that Chief mentioned that I think is uh, very interesting to find out. And you know, do people really realize that they stop when a pedestrian enters a crosswalk as opposed to they're not right in front of me? Um, so I think that's an interesting piece. Um, I. I basically can tell you that I've done some background research and I have a series of, you know, it, it's not hard to find a list of things you might want to know about an inventory of crosswalks in a community. There's a, um, you know, there, the University of North Carolina runs a, a pet bicycle program where they do nothing but try to identify those, those characteristics and countermeasures. Um, I, I would be willing to do some of it. 600 is a little beyond me, and so I think that's kind of where we're, we're sort of we're sort of there. Um, I'm curious if there's any conversation to be had about the kind of paint we use, and if you had anything come in front of you recently that might hope to last longer than you know they, they aren't lasting a season. Um, I know every now and then there's a little bubble up of uh, reflective pearls and white paint or, you know, different technologies and I would think that Alex is, you know, on, on those. I bet the uh, new proposed road is going to go in at um, Thompson Pleasant Street. All the thermoplastic will be recessed into the pavement by microplane. So they're hoping that will have some longer longevity with plowing and other activities out there wear and tear. Yeah, I walked, the, I walked the South Street, you know, we tried that. I, I, I first want to applaud you for being willing to try that. That was a, that was a experimental idea at, at, at that stage uh, where we recessed the green stripe into the street in the same way. Um, it's held up better. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's not magic. Right. Um, but I, I 
I'm curious what the difference in cost between the paint and thermoplastic. Thermoplastic is four to five times the cost of paint. Yeah. And paint you can typically get at least one year, if not two years out of, depending on where it's placed on the lane. Center lines last longer than most everything. Crosswalks get beat up pretty quickly. We try to do at least the schools in the high volume areas twice a year with the crosswalks. Some of them only get done once. We have one person that that's what he does. But the thermal plastic is nice. It's just that it's, it's expensive. When we're doing new pavement projects, everything's pretty put down with thermal plastic. Nice question about that. Has, has you done a cost benefit analysis in terms of the more expensive paint if it needs to be painted less frequently? Are we actually saving ourselves money because we're putting crews out there painting and repainting and repainting, which is a cost in and of itself versus the cost of the paint? I don't believe that analysis has to be So, I mean, there's all kinds of different paints that you can use. And the thing is that you, only, you, know, you can only put them down so thick, like I think the average is 15 mils or so. And after that, they don't dry properly. Less than that, they wear out quickly. So, we have machines we try to put down the upper amount that we can, and they can dry in a period of time. So, just to clarify, you, you were asking about the difference between thermal plastic, the expensive uh, inlay thermal plastic. No, I was hearing that she was looking at I'm, different qualities of paint out there to be used. I'm talking about in general, if we're uh, the paint that we're using currently, mm -hmm. if we were able to put a cost to the man hours that it takes to paint and repaint as often as we need to repaint versus using whether it be the thermal plastic or a higher quality of paint, I don't know and I don't care exactly. I just want to want us to be thoughtful about the costs involved. There are these unintended costs, I think, in the painting and repainting. Um, so it could actually be a cost savings to use a much more expensive paint if we're not repainting as frequently as what I'm saying. And you know, whether it be thermal plastic or another kind of paint, I don't know. But if we could get some kind of numbers about the man hours and the, it's all men in that crew, right? I can say man hours <laughs> saved. <laughs> so if we could get the cost of the man Actually, hours. Actually, this year it's being contracted out because we only really do inline painting last year. And then, so maybe it's a little bit easier to do that cost analysis if we're, in fact, it's a contract. We can look mm -hmm. at how much we're paying for the contract versus what it would cost yeah. to. We need to say it's going to be about street. 16 cents a foot for painting lines this year. That's our estimate looking at mass DOT prices. Wow. <coughs> um, well, I'd, I'd just like to go back. I know you tried different, you know, you, you tried different things. So I, I want to give credit where it's due. It's not like it's business as usual. I mean, you, you've tried the reflective beads in the paint. You've tried recessing thermal plastic on South Street to see how that's held up. Um, so, I mean, I do, I, I watch those things and I've been pretty, I applaud you for trying the new technologies when you find them. I mean, you can even see the new thermoplastic we put down the floor and center, the plows, I and mean, it's chipped already, it's coming up. That's why I'm kind of somewhat excited about the new roundabout project and how that recess, the microplaning and the thermoplastic being recessed is going to wear over time. Mr. Pomerantz, spoken. Um, just to go back to Devin's point about how do we take 600 crosswalks and try to prioritize which ones to look at, um, Ned, or in general, do we have any track count information on a GIS level? Oh, yeah. Not in here, so we could sort of prioritize by doing overlay by crosswalk location. If you go to the Mass DOT website, you can see where they have all their traffic counters, and you can see the volume of traffic that's going by on most city streets. Mm. Especially the main, especially the state numbered roads. Mm -hmm. Like um, you'll see them on Bridge Road, you'll see them on Route Nine, you'll see them on Route Ten, Route Five, Bridge Road. I mean, they're, they pop up. They got a nice little interactive map that tells you the uh, the year it was done, the and the traffic count itself. That doesn't so that, count though how many pedestrians are you are no, crossing. No, no, it gives you a count on the volume of vehicles, and then you assume there's more crosswalk pedestrian traffic in the core area of the city, then you get out into the hinterlands, you can sort of do a correlation to traffic counts and starting in the downtown and spread out. Well, those are state roads. They don't have any city traffic. When, when you're They're local roads. Yeah. Like South Street, once you get to the bridge at the Mill River Diversion, 
that turns to a local road, even though it has a state route number to it. We have data for local roads as well as what you're saying. Yeah, we have data for the state roads too in the layouts. That, that, uh, that's the appeal. Are you wondering about, Devin, about the, uh, the legality of our installing? No, no, I just didn't. Um, I went. How do you went, tackle 600 cars? Right. I, I mean, I went to Wayne's office to talk to the GIS person there, and uh, for the very same question, like, you know, how are we going to number and inventory? Let's, you know, in other words, if I if I did my little list of 12 things for a given crosswalk, of, of which some is traffic, then what do I even hang that on? In other words, what's the structure that we're going to collect? You know, does do you name them? Or, in other words, is it centered around schools and a mile around them? Is that a priority that we look at first, or is it any right. main, you know, state number route that comes into the community? Because that's where you're going to see the highest safety teams. I, Nancy, um, may I just ask uh, what the status is of the crosswalk from Edwards Church um, across to? Sullivan Square that has worn off so much that it's almost invisible. Is, is that being phased out? I don't think we've been to that eight, ten. It's been a long time since we touched that. I thought that was part of the cheap improvements we we're going to do for that intersection was to let that fade away so we confuse people when they did the new configuration. Right. And I don't know where that is. That's the new configuration is quite a bit of ways. Because Nelson and I are going to take the 25% uh, level. And the next phase is probably a $200,000 engineering study and design work to get done, and then finding money in the TIP program to do it. So that project is probably minimum eight years away. Well, I thought there was a quick and easy down and dirty that sort of thing that they were going to try. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to just ask a question. If we had some mechanism that boiled down 600 to 20, what then might we we do with that list of that manageable list of 20 crosswalks? Because um, it would seem to be sensible that someone would volunteer with the DPW or the DPW in concert with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Subcommittee to bring to the next meeting a list. Um, of criteria, kind of what you have in uh, draft form with traffic data that we can then decide, you know, we use this to, to whittle down the 600. That would seem to make sense to me. But once we do whittle it down and we have a manageable list, I guess my question is, what do we do with that list? Um, and do we want to go ahead and do that whittling and analysis and then have them in front of us? And so then we can then, as a commission, look at it and, and look at what might be possible to be done. I don't want to do something for the sake of doing just something. I, 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 you know, I want to do something that will actually make a substantive difference in terms of pedestrian safety around uh, key crosswalks. So, well, later on in the meeting today, I presume we're going to get to the, the fact that we still have $100,000 unspent of traffic calming you know, funds and and another request for more in the, in the next budget. And so um, we actually, for the first time in many years, have money to spend on traffic calming. Uh, and we have a list of uh, traffic calming requests. And now we'll have a list of crosswalks to say it's a little down to 20. Okay. Could we not merge these so that okay. we're focusing on crosswalks that are in traffic calming uh, uh, targeted areas? And, and, right. and focus our, our efforts on actually spending the money on the ground. I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, for the purposes of today's meeting, maybe we could come to a resolution about how we're going to move forward with the whittling process, and that would be good for today's meeting. Um, otherwise, we could, we could go on and on about crosswalks and we get a productive conversation, but it might be best just to, it might be best to, oh, go ahead. Well, I would just want to speak in support of prioritizing Anyway, okay. coming up with a rational way, an objective as possible, you know, not political way of, uh, of prioritizing from the 600 to 20, whatever the number is, okay. so that um, because we all agree that um, attention, more attention should be paid, even if we don't know exactly what it is, it seems to me we're going to have to do that. 
So I still think it's a good idea, even if we don't know exactly what we're going to do with the list of 20. Okay. So I guess what I would like to see happen is the next meeting, um, we have a whittled down list to look at. But I guess the question is, who would be willing to do that? Is that not a job of the, the subcommittee? The bicycle pedestrian? Yeah. Well, the DBW would have to be involved, I would hope. Well, uh, Alex's last day is the 29th. So we lost yeah. our transportation engineer to uh -huh. Mass DOT. Oh, just like that's never happened before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we'll be on the market for a new Last time it took six months to fill that position. You know, I don't, I don't want to blind, but I mean, what you want the answer to be is just really a stretch. I mean, um, how many crosswalks are there in a, a given geography? Do you look at the crash data? Do you look at the, you know, uh, what's the inventory structure? Is it numbered? Do you, do you have to look at even downtown because traffic's moving so slow and the main intersection signalized for crossing? So, are these rural ones that, I mean, the plan, what, what are we gonna do? And why are we looking at specific areas? That's why I suggest, are we looking at something that's a mile within any elementary or secondary school? Because they're probably walking to school and not being bused. So whatever Council. that range is, two miles, whatever that requirement is now. Just to build on what Councilor O'Donnell was saying, I mean, are we going to sit here and continue to talk about how to do the prioritization, or is that something that we're asking the pedestrian and um, by committee to do? If we want to go through all of these ideas about how we create the prioritization, I think we need to table this to next month because yep. we have this insane agenda today that we're not getting through. I, second, I just want to ask for a process. I second your description of our agenda is insane. <laughs> I think it is. Um, so I, I would agree. I, I would I would like the bicycle and pedestrian subcommittee to bring bring that instrument forward or that process forward for us to look at okay. factor I, in schools. I think that's wishful driving. thinking, but I will take it to the bicycle and ped subcommittee. But what you're actually expecting is a, a, a huge research project, and you're talking about a volunteer group. That I, I just I don't want to mislead you into saying yes, we'll come back with the top 20. I just view that as okay. being hard to defend. Well, the first thing we're asking for, though, I think is just a, a way of prioritizing how to figure out what those we'll top have 20 discussion. or 50 are. But I mean, if you if you feel, if you have a discussion in that committee and you want to bring it back to us and say, this is something that this whole commission needs to do, we'll put it on the agenda for when we have time on an agenda. So you know, if, if that's the, the conclusion we come to, we'll have to really consider. Okay. Yeah, because you're, you're absolutely right. It's a giant research. Project that's 600 plus crosswalks, and um, on the other hand, you know, I, I don't know how else we're gonna. I mean, that's the very reason why we need to do it is to whittle down the number to a manageable figure. But I realize it's a massive job, and if it's not something you can do, then maybe we can find other ways to leverage city resources to, to try and do it if others agree. So. Uh, can I ask, uh, uh, Chief and Director Holly, do you have to know if uh, PVPC would be in a position to give us technical support on that project? The technical support we typically see coming out of the TPC, or excuse me, Under Valley Planning Commission is um, collecting data like we did for Bridge Road and the pedestrian data at Beach Street. That was a study that was done. And I believe that they will fund two studies per year. Said, but they're typically traffic type studies, not a crosswalk study. I just saw today they're doing a survey in South Hadley of, of pet pedestrian uses of the bike trail, and it's it's a PVPC out of there, one of their planners. But do any of the engineering programs, Smith or UMass, do they have traffic um, specialization? Because I wonder if that could be a student project that could be UMass has farmed a, out. Has a big one. Mm -hmm. They've got simulators and things, but I don't mean. Smith, I, Smith could, in theory, do it, but obviously not in time. And maybe what makes it more manageable in the motion that I would like to make is you don't need to go through all the crosswalks. What we want is the criteria. 
So my motion would be we refer to the subcommittee a request that they bring back to us um, a, a number of criteria and a process by which we evaluate the crosswalks. Okay, that's, that's my motion. I second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor of the referral? <coughs> Opposed? Abstain. Okay, great. So we'll move on to another subject now. Um, let me just pause and ask, there are things on this agenda we're not going to get to. Are there any that we can just volunteer right now to continue to a future meeting? Or do you want to do it item by item? Let me say this then. Whenever we get to an agenda item, feel free to jump in and make a motion to continue it to the next meeting. That would be encouraged. Um, all right. So now we're at item eight, which is just updates from our departments, including the DPW. Sure. Well, I just told you the biggest news. Right. Uh, that was leaving at the end of next week for the 29th. Excuse me. So um, we'll be joining Laura Hansen over at MassDOT. So we're trying to get that posted and advertised as soon as we can and get an engineer here, especially we're coming into our construction season and we have all this pavement management work to be done this year. So uh, updates, let's see. Uh, the 2014 contract for paving is ending. Uh, Warner Brothers is up on Bridge Road completing that part of the project and some pump list items. Uh, we have a bid opening on May 28th, next Thursday, for our 2015 hot mix asphalt contract. Um, the Gorman Group has been awarded a contract for Cold in Place, which is basically recycling the existing mill materials, laying it back down, and then the hot mix asphalt contract will come back a few weeks later and put down a hot course on top. We expect to see about 50% resavings in our paving costs by doing it this way. We were up in Warwick Mass last year looking at our project, and it appears to go down quite well the whole, over the winter, too. So it uh, has to be done on streets have no utilities, so we're focusing on parts of Chesterfield Road and Reservoir Road to be done. Um, we expect most of the construction work to be done sometime in July to August, have this all wrapped up, hopefully. Uh, crack sealing contracts in place, we're waiting for all the roads to be swept so they can be uh, crack sealed. And we just got 25% design review plans from Mass DOT for exit 19, and the roundabout they're proposing there. Um, no engine brake signs. DPW <coughs> has uh, purchased 27 engine brake use prohibited except in emergency signs for across Northampton. And currently, two of the signs will be placed on Bridge Road, one by the roundabout and one down by the cemetery at North Elm Street. So we're moving forth with that. And the signs are also ordered for the, uh, the Parsons Street neighborhood for, for the fines, for no truck routes. Any questions for Ms. Charlie? Okay. Uh, quick question. I know the answer to this, but I'll just ask anyway. Any progress on uh, on any traffic common projects at all? Not at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, no, just enough. Though. Thanks for getting the bike lane on Bridge Street. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have a backlog of requests for the no engine brake signs? Do we know where those 27 are being placed? We have an inventory of where we're planning to place them. Basically, the state didn't want them in their layouts, so we're putting them on local roads everywhere that you're coming into the city, basically. So when you come into a local road, you'll see the sign. So we, we drew up a map of the city, and Alex and I sat down and got all the points we thought we should do with consideration for Bridge Road School. So that's how we came up with that. Okay, what did the sign say? They say, engine brake use prohibited except in emergency, which is what the ordinance says. Is that the ordinance under it? Good question. I forgot. Does the ordinance say that? It does. You have it in your package, I believe. Okay. I thought it was simply. It says right here, 31275, 
He said compression release engine brakes on a motor vehicle not properly equipped with an engine exhaust muffler as per state and federal regulations, or equipped with a defective damaged or appropriately mo modified engine exhaust muffler and or associated exhaust system components creates loud and excessively noise adversely affecting the public health, safety, and welfare of the residents of, North Ham of the city of Northampton and is prohibited. And then it talks down below, a little bit further down, except basically for emergency use only. That's why we did it that way. I mean, I, I read the first sentence as you can't use your compression brake if your muffler is malfunctioning. Um, and then it goes on to say that um, avoiding unnecessary use in non-emergency situations. So it's a very sort of mushy ordinance. I can't, uh, I can't sign a sign that big. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there lies like, the problem. I like the sign, and all the people who drive those trucks know what you're telling them. Yeah, yes. they do. I just think it's, um, you know, we don't want to in any way send a confusing message about needing to use your compression brake, even though it is loud, for the safety purposes uh, around a, a school or anywhere else. I mean, and every time you stop, they'll say a car slowed down suddenly in front of me, and I had to do it. But they're going, you're going forward with that administratively, anyway, so it's not really within our purview. So. Okay, anything on this item? Okay. Maybe it could segue into it, but we have another item. Number 10? Is it number 10? No. Okay. It is number 10? It is. Yes, it is. Okay, Councilor. Um, so the folks on Bridge Road, we've been doing all of this work around traffic calming around JFK. Mm -hmm. Um, so their big concern is that trucks um, coming in, if we're posting those signs only at the VA hospital on Route 9, which is what I was told, that's kind of the entrance to the city as it were before it gets... It would be up by Thumb Time somewhere, or that vicinity, yeah. Right. And then the other one would be coming into Bridge Road from right by King Street somewhere in that vicinity, correct? I know Alex today specifically told me that we were going to post one at North Elm Street which is by the Gables condominium project, the cemetery, right. where it comes on the bridge road, and then one immediately after the roundabout. Immediately after the roundabout. Coming on bridge road towards JFK. But after the roundabout? Yes. So that would be on Route 9, that's not on, no, on, the, road. on the bridge. Road. Road. Oh, so coming into, yeah. OK. Yeah, that's the bigger deal. All right, because the concern of the folks there is that they're People seeing, the, are, signs they're seeing the, the sign, right, and they're also racing through North Maple Light, the trucks, and that's why they're putting, they're applying the engine brakes when all of a sudden they realize that they're in a school zone mm -hmm. after they race through that light, that's when they're applying the compression brakes. So the question was, can we get one um, either right before or right after North Maple? Then you'd lose the one on North Elm Street, at North Elm Street. And what's the thinking behind having it on North, on North Elm? Just a common point where vehicles come out and trucks use the street, that way they see it. If they weren't coming up King Street, from King Street, they'd never see the sign if they came out on North Elm. So we're trying to put them in somewhat strategic locations to try to get them seen by as many people as we can. So if you specifically want one there, we'll look at it there and we can move it from another side. Yeah, I think it's a real concern because it is, it is true that the trucks are speeding up to get through that light, and then all of a sudden they're coming up on the, the school zone signs. Mm -hmm. Soon to be lights. Okay. Are there anything else on this? Is this an actual request that you want a vote on? Is that why? Is that part of your um, Well, maybe we can table. I mean, it sounds like uh, Director Helping's going to look into that. Yeah. That's a possibility, and we'll be in touch about that. And if it doesn't seem like it's going to happen, maybe okay. we'll I'll push it more. Great. So you're moving to continue this into the next meeting. Yeah. Second for that for continuing this. Good. Pomerant seconds. Any discussion on continuing? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Great. Um, here's an example of what I want to do. Item 11. I'm, I'd like to withdraw this ordinance completely uh, because I. I haven't heard back from the mayor, and I'll just I figure I'll let the mayor um, deal with it. It has to do with changing 
where it's part of the division manager to a different term since after the mayor's administrative order that term has changed. So without objection, it's withdrawn. Uh, number 12, um, this is an ordinance um, to amend 312 section 31. Uh, for the purpose of prohibiting parking in municipal parking lots during a snow emergency during certain hours. Um, this is proposed by the mayor. Um, you have in the packet, along with a description from Lynn Simmons, the mayor's chief of staff, um, she points out that um, this, um, she wants people to use, um, a, a lot of this came from Shelton Field on Bridge Street. And um, for adding words, municipal parking lot to the section that covers where people cannot park during snow emergencies. So right now the ordinance says, um, during the winter parking season, no person shall park any vehicle during a snow emergency on any street between the hours of, of 12.01 and 6 a.m. Now we're adding any street or municipal parking lot. So, I mean, Nancy, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that from your perspective in parking. But well, that Sheldon Field parking lot falls under the recreation department, correct? The parking lot? I don't know. I mean, when you say it falls under the recreation department, what do you mean? It, it seems like all administrative action for that Sheldon Field parking lot tended to fall to the recreation department to maintain and... So you don't enforce anything? Well, enforcement aside, um, and central service doesn't do that. No, no, there's no collection, there's no maintenance. Is there anywhere to find what a municipal parking lot is? I want to say yes, but I, I don't have the information in front of okay. me. Okay. Does that mean that for excuse me, enforcement purposes, they'd have to contact the police department to if there was some kind of violation? Um, depends on, yes. Well, it depends on the violation. Well, let's see. Um, handicap spaces are enforceable in our private property, public property, or public ways. So if they have handicap spaces that are truly marked, we can have to go Unless it's posted any other way for terms of length of parking, there's nothing we can do. Just like the high school parking lots are under the school department. They can post them as they want, but unless they get a city ordinance supporting what they want, I can add some information that the current ordinance says under penalties for violations um, during a snow emergency any vehicle which is parked in violation of this section may be towed upon the order of the director of public works or the police department. I don't think we've ever tagged or towed anything from Sheldon. Well right now Sheldon would not be included under, under this but we'd be adding it yeah. and any municipal parking lot so presumably to work roundhouse lot or anywhere else, armory. <coughs> okay. I, mean, I didn't read it, but is it the same hours for any other municipal lot? Um, it's all 12.01 to 6 a.m. So if the purpose is to keep the parking lots clear overnight during snow emergencies. So. I think there's also a new question that's kind of come up over and over again over the last few months, which is with the new train station, the depot without designated parking for that, that people are going to start you know, for a week at a time if they're going away, leaving cars, places. Mm -hmm. So the question is, I think, not just for snow removal purposes, but just long-term parking in those kinds of places like Sheldon Field. I mean, I can't imagine someone's going to park in Sheldon Field, per se, and walk all the way to the train. Mm -hmm. well, we actually have a related item, item 20, which has to do with the 24-hour parking limit in municipal parking lots. So, so but with regards to just the snow, the ordinance that the mayor has brought forward that's just about snow emergencies in municipal parking lots. I don't know what the pleasure of the commission is. I mean, to me it seems good fairly, and I, I guess the question is why would you want it to be the other way? Why would you want people to be parking overnight in municipal parking lots? So I guess they have somewhere to put their car when they're on the street. I mean, I, I'm not sure what problem we're fixing here. Are these parking lots in for long periods of time? I, there's some reason the mayor's office has brought this before us, but I'm I'm not sure what we're fixing. Well, everybody goes to the garage first off. Uh -huh. and if the garage is filled, 
then they look for the first cloud city lot. Because they've got to be off the streets. Okay. So there's kind oh. of this. Um, I mean, the only place that they can park other than the parking garage would be Armory Street lot. Right, that's designated. Right. And that's the first one that's hit. That's a good point. That's a problem we're solving. Guess given the high density of the neighborhoods in the Richard area, that if they have an alternative place to park during a snowstorm that's not on the street, so they can throw the hood of the Sheldon lot, and when the storm's over, they go to work. I don't recall ever getting, we can do 72 hour notices there because there's a public lot. It's, you know, we never got, to my knowledge, we never got a man in there that, that unless it was stolen, it was out there. So I, I don't know what the okay. problem is ever solved. So the DBW plows Sheldon Field? I believe we do. So I guess the question would be, do you have problems plowing it? This year we probably did. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what's your pleasure? Will you continue this to the next meeting? I mean, hopefully it's not going to snow anytime soon, so we can take our time with this. Yeah, I'd like to find out where, what, what the history behind this request is. Is there a motion to, to continue? That's a motion to take it. Is there a sec to continue with the next meeting? Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Now we have another ordinance uh, for the purpose of prohibiting the operation of heavy commercial vehicles on parts of Barrett Street and Bates Street. So directions. I got this from our departing traffic engineer, uh, Mr. Huntley. I don't know if you want to speak to it. I absence. can't because I tried to talk to Alex today and he left early at two, so I never got to have the conversation on this particular. Because I was curious why it's proposed from the DPW. I don't have that answer. Okay. I mean, currently, you also have the, the current law about where trucks are prohibited from going. That's 312.75. And it looks like it's just closing some loopholes here. Um, for example, it is prohibited for heavy commercial vehicles to travel from Bridge Street to North Street on Day Avenue. When you get to the end of Day Avenue, which is my street, it turns into Bates Street. Um, and so this would add Bates Street. It adds it in a southeasterly direction um, from Bradford Street to North Street. So it's saying you could not travel from the industrial park to Bridge Street through the residential neighborhood that way. I have no problem with adding that prohibition. Personally, I think that makes sense trucks are not really supposed to go that way. As for Barrett Street um, to Carlton Drive. Carlton. Uh, is it Carlton? Yep. Carl? Yes. It's Carlton. Mm -hmm. um, to Carlton Drive. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess. Does I have to do with the fire station? No, we've got large fuel trucks that have to go to the planning, you've got the tractor trailers that get to deliver to the auto parts place. Every construction equipment guys that start their stuff and move on it. Storage areas of Car I think Carlin is the the start of the no commercial. I'm guessing the start of the no heavy commercial right. up there. Yes with Carlin and Jackson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jackson Street, the entire length of Jackson Street is prohibited for these vehicles. So if we would accept that, there would be no reason for a commercial vehicle to travel up and bear it to Jackson, I suppose. So, I mean, frankly, I don't see any problem with that in that. I guess I just don't have any other information about the genesis of it, since Alex is not here. So. They can find out and have an answer for you. Okay, so we'll continue this one too, perhaps. Uh, so we to continue. Okay, Councilor Klein moves to continue. Is there a second? Is there any second to continue? The second. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Devin moves to second. Okay. Any discussion on continuing? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Now we have the final ordinance. Um, Ms. Forstall, do you want to explain this? Introduce it. I'll, I'll try and make this as quick and easy as possible. A um, little background, if you'll look at in your packet, 
312.99, violations and penalties. Um, Northampton accepts the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 90, Section 20A and a half, to regulate our parking tickets, our fines, and our waste penalties. Um, and as it stands right now, if you look at our ordinance, um, item C, all the way at the very end, it says any person who fails to pay the above described penalty within 21 days of the issuance of the ticket shall be subject to an additional penalty of $10 prior to notification by the parking clerk for the registry of motor vehicles of such failure to pay. So they have the ticket is issued 21 days to pay the ticket at the set fine. Let's say it's a $15 ticket. After the 21 days, if it remains unpaid, $10 late fee is added, uh, it becomes a $25 ticket because of the fine. When it remains unpaid and the registry is notified by our office that this remains as an unpaid ticket, an additional $10 penalty actually shows up in there. And then the registry adds a $20 surcharge. So, and that's been consistent for many, many years. But the way that the ordinance is currently written, somewhere, somehow, it missed that other $10 penalty. So what I'm asking is that we, improve the language of C so that it actually spells out the procedure in a clear manner. And there isn't that omission of that additional $10 penalty. So I would like it to read, any person who fails to pay the above described penalty within 21 days of issuance of the ticket shall be subject to an additional penalty of $10. Failure to pay within 60 days of the issuance of the ticket shall result in notification by the parking clerk to the registry of motor vehicles. <coughs> Upon such notification, another penalty of $10 shall be added in addition to any registry surcharge. Because that is actually what is taking place. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think that our, our wording should be uh, improved to reflect what is actually taking place. Bring us in conformance with reality. Right. Okay. To your knowledge, I mean, is this, are, are these subsequent fines based on, on state law? Or, yes. Okay, so it's not like we have had no authority to fine people. Right. Because, this, okay. because we, we have, as a city, has accepted um, Chapter 90, Section 28 and a half to regulate us, and it's spelled out in that chapter and in that section. So, Nancy, has anybody ever come in and said, well, I don't see where it is in the ordinance, so I'm not paying the additional $10? No, because it's spelled out on all of our notices. It is. It's spelled okay. out on our tickets. It's just that the language of the ordinance needs to be. codifying real. Okay. okay. Was there a motion for a positive recommendation? No. I'll make a motion. Mr. Conrad, so move a positive recommendation. Is there a second? For ordinance 312-99. Okay. To okay. change the wording so it's clear and appropriate. Okay. And the chief seconds it. Is there a discussion on the cause of recommendation? Thank you for putting us together. Um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, so look, we have 10 minutes left. Um, I'd like to get a consensus about what we're going to cover, because we're not going to cover the rest of this. Personally, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have a brief discussion about the parking study, which we're in the receipt of. Um, and, um, are there any other urgent items that we must discuss at this meeting today, or can we move the others? Feel free to next one. The whole thing next one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know who says that. <laughs> What's your retirement date? Uh, the day before this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. So much. Oh, I know. I had to come back. One more. 
So I, I, I will not be here for the June meeting. So anything of mine that gets moved will have to be moved beyond that. Okay. Is there going to be a July meeting likely? Well, why don't we why don't we do this? Um, I move to continue items 16 through 20, with the exception of 17B, which we've already done, to our next meeting. Is there a second for that motion? That's for five seconds. Um, any discussion on continuing? All in favor? All right. Aye. People feel getting tired. Opposed? Okay. I was thinking of Ray LaBarge's last city council meeting. He voted no on everything just so he could. <laughs> I had, just had that image come in from that. Stay, stay classy, okay? <laughs> on your last day. So just on item 15, the, the parking study, I don't think my suggestions we not get into the actual recommendations of the study today. But I, the question I want to discuss is, what's the role of this commission for implementing any of these suggestions or not implementing these suggestions? And holding more public hearings about them if necessary. Council. Yeah, I wanted to make a motion to. Well, I don't know if we need a motion yet, but I would like to make a suggestion for a series of hearings. I think probably two hearings, um, and it might be useful to have one in the Florence area as well as one downtown, um, and do <coughs> different stagger them at different times. Maybe do one uh, at five o'clock and one at seven o'clock in the evening to get different groups of folks. It just seems like it's something that we, we need to listen to the community about more than um, some of our more mundane business. Okay. And you would want to have one in Florence even though it's a downtown parking study? Um, just to draw folks from Leeds and Florence who don't tend to come downtown, but they want to have something to say about coming okay. downtown. <laughs> Do the consultants already have that? Statement of work about scheduling meetings. How many are? Well, they did one public meeting to present the report, and so they're technically they're done. I think they're there to support us if we need to. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, they their, their scope of work is complete. Uh, when they turn the report over to the city. Uh, of course, they're there for you know, advice and assistance as needed, but uh, the contracts are completed. So when they did the presentation at the uh, second meeting at the senior center, uh, March 27th, I think, whatever it was, something like that. April 27th. Um, that was there, and they're done. Okay. And they hand the report over to the city. And is the city council wanting the Transportation and Parking Commission to take the lead in scheduling hearings? Has that discussion happened? Um, no, well, no, no one has, has asked me to do that, but unless the mayor is going to take, is going to start proposing ordinances, which that was not my understanding. I, I think the mayor thought we would take the lead on any implementation. I don't know, does that match what you? Last discussion I had with the mayor was before the April 27th meeting of the okay. senior center. And we were still sort of mulling all that over. What happens post, post study and post consult? I guess. I think that's a good question, though, because I know that, for instance, with the um, vibrant sidewalks resolution that was referred by the city council to the social services committee to conduct the hearings. So I'm not sure if technically we need to, in fact, have that assigned to us by the council. But then, so you would want to wait for an actual ordinance or series of ordinances to come to the council and be referred to us, then we have hearings on them. Um, and I. What I was thinking is, I don't even know what the ordinances would say at this point. Or do we need more public comment before even drafting changes to our laws regarding how much you know the meters cost, how much our fines are, what are the hours, and so forth. Um, I guess whether or not we originate action, if we're going to be involved in the process, it seems like we need to have more public comment at some stage. That was my thinking. So. One, concrete suggestion I was going to make is for our next meeting, we, if it were convenient, we could hold it at 5.30 as opposed to 4 o'clock and then we could invite the public to just comment. We could make it clear that we wanted to hear about people's thoughts on the parking study. That would be one simple way to do one meeting. 
I'm sorry for the sidebar. Oh, um, no. Yes, that's a fine idea. I think um, there, I was disappointed in some components of, that were missing from the parking study, which is a recommendation for more parking needs to be balanced in public view with what that's going to cost the community, and that was not, I think, clearly covered there. Um, it wasn't put in context to population considerations or, or uh, the number of cars. I mean, I, I, brought a study today that says from out of the University of Michigan, we've hit peak car already. So I, I think I think I, I had hoped for more from that parking study. And so I, I'm, I'm uncertain how to put that into what I went to the briefing that they gave and it was as I expected and as is right. City businesses saying we need more parking. And I think that needs to get balanced against what it costs to have more parking. So I don't know if there's a way to, no, that's it. Okay. Well, is, are we not, as a commission, ready to say we want a hearing, public hearing at this stage? Do we want to wait and have more internal discussions with the mayor, for example? Um, how would you like to proceed um, with the parks so we can simply take no action? I would just hope that we, we do get involved at some point in the process and solicit more public input before putting our, our stamp on any specific proposal. What's the status of the, uh, the parking subcommittee? It's, it's gone. Okay. So we're it. Then I, I support your uh, expression of interest in having this commission, this committee, okay. weigh in, discuss further. And I'm also fine with posting Well, do you want to just leave it there? There's a general consensus about having a public hearing, and we can, oh, council. Yeah, I just want to um, kind of think about the process a little bit more together. I think that um, Councilor O'Donnell brought up a good point that if we, once we get to the point of drafting ordinances around the recommendations, we're going to, I would imagine we're going to have to have a public hearing for each of those ordinances or a whole set of them. So there, there will be hearings at that point. There were two community meetings in relation to the parking study that they, the parking study people conducted. So we had two, and we will probably have at least one, if not several, when we propose ordinances. So I just, I also want us to think about how much deliberation. I mean, we need to be transparent. We need to be gathering public um, opinion about all of this. There is no question about that, but. The question is how much and when and what the triggers are for it. So I just kind of want to say that before we make a decision about creating hearings now. Well, and also I could leave it, we can leave it here. I mean, the open meetings law does not prohibit us from discussing the date of a meeting. So we could certainly follow up by email to have a discussion to schedule a meeting if we can't figure it out today. So that might be the best thing to do. I don't, I'm not hearing a clear message from the commission that yes, we want to schedule a meeting in June for the public to come comment. No. Wait. Wait for more. Okay. That's satisfactory. I was just putting it as a discussion, kind of opening that to discussion. I don't know if people had a response. To I'll have a time meeting. I won't be here in June, so I'm happy to have it be after right. June. So I suggest for the time being we, we leave it and we'll decide. Right. Without objection? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. One minute. I'm going to give it to the chief. Okay. Who made the second? What? Second. <laughs> second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye.